All right, thanks everyone for gathering. Um, I asked two of our brightest minds uh, from the MPC and uh, Tech Immersive teams to join to talk about some of the exciting areas of research and innovation that are going on uh, here at Technicolor. Um, within our facility, within the business units, and within um, the research and innovation team that's based in Rennes, France, uh, who have a lot of interesting explorations going on all frontiers of film pipeline management, uh, but also VR, AR, what's the future of mixed reality and how it applies to immersive media. Um, so thanks for joining, uh, Nick and Jason. Uh, I'm Brian, I'm the um, producer at the Technicolor Experience Center. And Nick and Jason, do you want to give a little intro? Sure, uh, I'm Nick Mitchell. I'm the VP of Immersive Technology here at the Tech. Uh, I've been with Technicolor since about 2005. Uh, built a number of their digital cinema mastering workflows and the facilities that that perform those activities. Um, and now that that's, I wouldn't say boring, but uh, a little uh, less than problematic, uh, I, I like to go find where the problems are and this seemed to be the right place. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. So I'm Jason Shugart, a VFX supervisor for MPC, uh, visual effects career of 20 years or so in commercials and advertising film. Um, more recently uh, at MPC for the last couple of years, uh, began in VR like two, three years ago. Um, largely for the same reason, a lot of the problems had been solved on the VFX side, and VR was uh, was a was an open landscape of, of new new challenges. So it was an exciting field to get into. Cool. So um, you know, obviously we we've done. Um, explorations in all emerging fields uh, of immersive media, um, but we wanted to touch on some of the highlights today um, that have actually um, you know, been formed into small demos or that we've integrated into projects. Um, so we'll kick it off with um, that our RNI team is exploring their own volumetric video capture pipeline. Um, so there are a couple interesting tools they've built. Um, one is a, a camera array that might be similar to a Lytro rig or something you would see um, from some of the other light field capture providers. Uh, and then the second is an actual uh, virtual light field camera array inside of Maya um, and blending those two pipelines of how do you, how do you create uh, virtual assets and real world assets uh, and push them through a volumetric pipeline. And also how do you edit, uh, which is a big challenge. Um, so Nick, do you wanna speak to the demos a little bit? Yeah, so um, the demos that we put together thus far have been largely proof of concept. Um, the guys in Wren shot some, some footage. Um, uh, one was um, um, effectively a scene, I don't know if we've got it here, but a uh, scene from a museum. <coughs> um, and and this, this was a way for us to both uh, test and demonstrate capture as well as play out. So we had volumetric capture. Uh, we also had streaming capabilities. And now we're kind of working out the middle pipeline in there to be able to take light field and take that data and process it into volumetric streaming data that can be sent to standard kind of decoders. Yeah, volumetric uh, or light field capture has been uh, sort of holds the holy grail of being able to capture something photographically yet be able to walk around in, a, in at least in a small area, a small volume, uh, and witness that from multiple angles. So I think this holds a whole lot of potential. Uh, the, in many ways, brings us back to uh, 20 years ago and be able to handle doing, using techniques that handle that large amount of data, because the footprint's huge uh, from a production point of view. Um, we've worked with Lytro projects. Uh, we've worked with several other, uh, worked on Facebook, there was other, uh, other capture techniques that have 17 cameras, or in Lytra's case, it was 96 cameras mm -hmm. times 30 frames a second times however long your piece is. Uh, it winds up being terabytes and terabytes of data. So being able to capture all that data and then compress it down to a streamable format is, is no, uh, no small feat for sure. Um, but the, the result of that is, I think, quite amazing where you, you know, everybody else, the other end of that is coming back to uh, create characters in VR with CG, um, you're then fighting the uncanny valley, uh, you know, recreating that, that experience and being able to get that performance of your favorite actor. Um, the only way to really currently do that is photographically and uh, 
I think this holds a lot of potential. Absolutely. Yeah, and the, the real innovation um, that occurred is, is you know, you have, a, you have a distribution problem when you capture light field content as well, which is how are you going to open it up for the consumer to actually see it and understand the value of it with six degrees of freedom yeah. that it enables. Um, so Jason, I believe on the, on the Lytro project, did you bring that through a game engine? How did you guys ultimately uh, more distribute? Lytro project, actually that was, that was an unfortunate situation. We had begun to work on the project for Montana, which is a JT, uh, Justin Timberlake music video. And uh, it was shot on Lytro, however, uh, halfway through the, through the project, uh, the Six Degrees of Freedom version wasn't nailed down, and uh, that was right when Lytro closed. So uh, that kind of, uh, that was an unfortunate uh, occurrence. True. And they had built their own proprietary pipeline. They, right? they did. Google but bought them out. Yeah. What, so what, what our research and innovation team focused on was how do you distribute um, volumetric content through standards uh, that have all, already been established? And so the amazing thing about this uh, museum demo is that uh, it's all streamable in MP4 containers. Uh, but it still preserves six degrees of freedom. So you can actually get in a VR headset and you can look around individual objects in the scene um, and you can see behind um, the, the guy that you're seeing in the, in the front uh, lower right. Um, and so it is a fully volumetric scene uh, streamed over an MP4 container. Yeah, and that's, I think, important format is when you start working in, in media that already has a history, a track history in uh, in editing tools and techniques, then there's already a shorthand language with directors and uh, DITs all the way through the process to be able to deal with that. It's a little bit more comprehensible than say, okay, this is a game engine. Uh, it's a whole different work style. We need to have a lot of things locked up ahead of time and it, it, it's different. Here, volumetric light field capture, you shoot it, you edit it, uh, it winds up having a lot of the similar uh, techniques and problems that you would experience on a, a flatty production. Right. Just exponentially more. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is kind of like working in this field, like dealing with uh, HD footage, but back in 1990. You know, that's like dealing with 2K footage in 1995. Uh, you had, we were faced with the same challenges. Like, how are we going to make this play back? We need a giant array that's maybe 30 megabytes you know, and uh, stream this all back through. Yeah, so in addition to the capture and the display and streaming, there's a compression and a distribution pipeline that needs to be worked out as well. And that compression technique is, is a big challenge right now. Right. So that project's ongoing, um, but it is a very cool demo that, um, you know, we, we have gotten up and running here, so we can make a, schedule other appointments to check it out. Um, so next, uh, we, we've also been exploring VR analytics, and this comes in a couple different areas um, in terms of VR review um, and also VR saliency and understanding heat mapping and how people consume the data. Um, so uh, first, maybe you can speak to the sal saliency tool, and then we'll jump to VR review. Yeah, so uh, for uh, our colorists who have been working in the sort of traditional media space, uh, Grading 360 content presents a bit of a challenge. Uh, it's, it's hard to know where the, the sort of area that people are going to be looking at is. Um, so we've developed a couple of algorithms that find um, salient regions that have uh, information in it that, that we believe humans tune into uh, that, that effectively scans a sequence of images and can present to you maybe three or four areas of, of your full 360 picture uh, to use for grading purposes. So you can grade your individual sort of three or four frames that are effectively extracts from that full 360 surround, and then blend those grading changes uh, into a, a full scene sort of grade. <coughs> so um, this, this just kind of, it, it provides a little bit faster awareness of where some of the challenging components of a given uh, scene or environment are that you need to color or grade. I think that's great too, because that's also building in a workflow that traditional uh, flame colorists can, can you know, stack on top of. Uh, we've worked on projects that are 9.6K, this uh, Montana job with uh, Justin Timberlake, where asking a flame to open that up and do anything with it was just nearly impossible. So. 
the technique is, you know, open up a nuke, and then we extract the area, and then we give them just that little part, and they do it, and we drop it right back in. So building a pipeline and a workflow that can uh, leverage that, then you suddenly gain a whole, um, a whole workforce that is already familiar with flat extractions and, and can deal with it properly. They just have to make sure they don't hit the edges. You know, short rules for that. Right, and that, that's a valuable tool for the kind of traditional post pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, we're also working on a VR review tool that's more of a response to the needs that you found from some of your immersive experience design in the game engines. So can you speak to, um, you know, what were the challenges and, and the uh, needs as sure. you went through these client reviews? Well, we're, what we were running into, and just speaking to, the, there's th sort of two different workflows. One, let's talk about 360 video, and then another for uh, real-time game engine. 360 videos, the the hardest thing was, especially if you're dealing with um, uh, gear, you know, gear VR or something along the lines where it's just a mobile headset and you're not able to output that video, you're often putting the headset on, pointing up in the air, nobody can see what you're looking at, and you're, you're talking about a thing. You give them the headset, they put it on in a different orientation, and it's not in the same spot. And so uh, through, through iterative process, we learned, like, you know, it'd be great if we could do this with a director, and, you know, they can see the exact same thing. And so when, I'm, when I put the headset on, I see them next to me. And there's several apps out there like that already have done this with you know, big screen or uh, you know, virtual desktop, VR chat, and some other ideas like that, where you're in 360 videos and you see other people there. But then you realize, oh, well, you don't necessarily even have to be in the same room. You can really extend this to do uh, other things. And you're talking about VR production in virtual reality. And they could be in London or New York. And so this, uh, it was just a sort of a very organic process to come into uh, the natural ideas. These aren't like uh, mind blowing. It's just like a workflow that, oh, I need to talk to somebody. Uh, I'm going to publish my video. They can put their headset on, you know, download it. We can all hop in, talk about the same thing at the same time in different places. Um, and so these are, it, it winds up being a tool that's a collaboration tool on 360 videos. And, uh, has other potentials beyond that too, um, whether it's a social platform or you, you just you draw the lines out. Switching over to uh, real-time game engine pro you know, production, you wind up having that same sort of interface where, okay, now I've got developers and I've got uh, directors not in the same place and we want to be able to share and I want to see what they're exactly seeing. Uh, I also have a QA team that's in a different country um, that I want to work together with. So we're dealing with not only uh, simultaneous, um, simultaneous you know, interactions where I can talk to something and they can see what I'm looking at and I can point at it. Um, by, you know, by far, the most, uh, you know, the most effective uh, workflow is when you're sitting somebody ne next to somebody, you can look, them, you know, look at them in the eye and you can point at you know, a screen and you can say, okay, I need you to do this. And you can look at them and see if they get it or not. Uh, the next best thing to that is actually being able to point and talk to them, and you can you can read a lot of gestures off of sixed off headsets, and there's there's like a, a a level of communication that you don't get just over the phone or even on a small little video chat. So you're dealing with another country, even out of time zone, being able to deliver notes, uh, annotations that they can open up a headset and be able to walk around and see the same thing you're seeing, just 13 hours off. Um, so there's, there's a long, long list of ideas and things that we're, we're bringing to this tool. Uh, it, it's, I don't think it's anything uh, out of the ordinary of what we already do every day. It just winds up being better uh, and more connected, especially when we're so far apart. The amazing thing once we started working on this tool was realizing the overlap of the needs of a review tool for actually creating the process of the projects. and. Um, just the, the baseline foundational template that is a good social VR experience, yeah. right? The basic need to be able to go inside of a shared experience with someone, uh, be fully embodied or at least embodied with enough uh, gestural input that you can communicate with them clearly. And so um, we actually you know, took some of the foundation of this tool and folded it back into what we use as a template for our VR projects so that as a baseline, um, our, our projects going forward can be inherently social, um, can allow people to have networked experiences where they're embodied, where they have interaction, and they can interact with the props in their environment to communicate with each other. 
which I think is some of the um, you know most successful VR experiences right now with VR chat and, and things like that being yeah, very by, popular. By far, I mean obviously when you're building these tools, you want to have building blocks that you're you're not having to start over from scratch every single time. So I think as we you know as we start to do and, and build the workflow, we have a base layer that we can just say, okay, that's this is our uh, you know this is our starting point. Everything is going to be built on top of that, and that's that's it has a huge value. Right. And so, so we touched on the uh, applications of that salience tool to um, VR color management. Um, you've also done some, some more work in the color management space to ensure quality across headsets, right, in this yep. pipeline? And to the same point where the VR review tool uh, touches on that a little bit, um, one of the challenges uh, was not just being able to put a headset on and, and communicate with your director like how, uh, how it looks, you need to make sure that if he's not looking at a headset at the same exact time, which is a whole thing, like being in the same, you know, same experience at the same time and talk about it that way. Otherwise, he or you are looking at the monitor, and uh, that's, there's no guarantee that's the same color space. I, actually, I can guarantee there's not. It's not the same color space. Uh, not much we've learned. <laughs> you know, between, between Oculus, Vive, and uh, a random HP monitor, you're going to have a wide variety of different color uh, spaces there. So the result of it was the uh, reaching out to Ren and uh, talking to the team there and building color pipeline that we can grade shows on and bring all of the uh, the hundred years of film experience to uh, to the VR space. Basically, all the you know our, our directors come to us expecting us to be color correct, and now uh, you know we have we're dealing with a Rec 709 uh, monitor. We can put a LUT on a uh, Vive and pull that into Rec. 709 color space, uh, a Rift, and any other future headset. So as we progress, um, we, can, we can be able to uh, work in a workflow that directors are used to and also know that any future headset we are you know, popping in. I think it's really important, though, to mention that <coughs> um, we can build those LUTs, but, but the reason that it's complicated today is that you can't actually calibrate a headset. They don't have any functions <clears throat> within the consumer devices that allow you to run any kind of a calibration methodology. So it's, it's really about preparing the content uh, and, and effectively emulating through, through lookup tables um, what you know the headset should look like <laughs> rather than uh, effectively trying to put a LUT it's somewhere in the headset or, or the chain of the Oculus or the Vive or whatever. So it's doing that conversion. They, they don't actually allow that, that calibration. So this is, this is a tool that allows us to um, effectively level the playing field in post and understand the changes that we have to make for the content that's going to each specific platform. Yeah, and the, the project that we did the most learning on for Color Pipeline where this where the tool was obviously, we felt the need, was the last goodbye. Uh, that went to Sundance last year. And it had, a, it had sort of the worst case. You had 360 video that had to play alongside, cut back and forth between that and real-time game engine. So those kind of have to feel like the same world. And I can look at it on a monitor, but I, you know, it, it, it's how do you judge that? I've got a new artist that's as great in color here on the 360 video, but in Game Engine, it's a different thing. Um, so it, was, it also became apparent like, oh, that color calibration tool and the, uh, the VR collaboration project where I could have a director in New York or in the same room work with the colorist and have their favorite colorist sit there in Game Engine uh, dialing you know, the very familiar knobs uh, to be able to grade their piece and make it look like uh, you know, the, the level that MPC can bring. Um, and this relates to the VR review process as well. Um, but, you know, in, in tandem with the VR review where you can go in together um, and experience and make notes, uh, we also have a way to record uh, actions as you go through a six degree of freedom game engine experience um, so that you can actually have replayable sessions, um, so, which is incredibly valuable because um, you never quite know how your user is going to consume the content until you get it into their hands. And so being able to review specific sessions with uh, directors or with the team and programmers and uh, being able to recreate bugs is also super valuable. 
So um, we built out a, a set of tools to record those sessions, uh, share them, so that we can have more specific, um, you know, review and touch points when we're when we're talking with the developers and, and programmers. Um, did you um, have you guys used this in production yet? Uh, no, but definitely uh, have had the need, and this is sort of yeah. bolting on to one Uber app that we're we're talking about. You you start to see all the problems that we're having in production, and how far do you break them apart? But this is exactly the QA type of tool that you would need, not from you know, if you're just having somebody develop uh, and find bugs, or if you want to be able to give notes as a supervisor or uh, as, a, as a director, um, this is exactly the type of tool that you can give somebody's experience. It also winds up being, in some ways, um, analytics. So you're running multiple people through. Uh, potentially, you could have them. You see their camera frustrum from where they're looking. And uh, instead of the, in the 360 video example, the saliency video you saw earlier, uh, that's an example of where a heat map of where something could be where people are looking. This does the same thing or has the same potential to do where you have multiple people looking uh, in a particular area. You have an idea of where to focus your energy on. Um, you know, I, there's, there's certain cases where uh, a 360 video feels like such a waste and many times and often in game engine you have to build the entire world out even if you know they're going to look this way, you need them to look this way. Uh, ultimately, you don't have control, but when, when you're actually uh, building an experience and you have random people looking in the wrong direction, you kind of want to know those results of how that, that, uh, that user experience was. And you can really just focus in on the area that needs to be, uh, you know, have the most value, and you can just uh, put your energy there with tools like this. So a couple other things I wanted to touch on uh, that relate peripherally to this uh, VR scene recording. Um, is there was another research and innovation project um, that translated to, to real world cinematography, which was how do you program drones to be spatially aware? And there's a lot of overlap right now with what's going on in the game engines um, in terms of, uh, so Unity has a tool called Cinemachine, and you can build smart cameras and virtual cameras that know where they are in space, know where the objects that they're meant to be tracking are in relation to each other, and can actually build scenes procedurally. Um, and so we're, we're trying to replicate that in the real world and have a one-to-one -one translation between how can you build essentially a, a software system um, that is spatially aware and um, every recording device in that system knows the ideal framing and um, you know, how to cut between them at what points to, to maintain interest. And so um, you know, as, as Jason said, these are all internal tools that, that are touching on disparate areas, um, but eventually you realize that um, as a whole, this tool suite just makes uh, content creation easier yeah, for Yeah, you sort of see the users. applications for that that might be sporting events or uh, even, you know, whether it's professional or just amateur, something along the, uh, right now the dads are out there with a, you know, a long pole and a camera. Yeah. Um, but we're not far out, off that I'd say that you know, personal drones could be out there and you'd have uh, you know, gather that footage and be able to cut it into like a, a, like a professional looking sporting event. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so on the other side of the tracks for the consumption side, um, we've also been exploring uh, mixed reality multi-screen recording. So basically um, networked experiences uh, that link up what you're seeing on a screen uh, with you know, 3D assets or other things that link up to the content on screen coming off of the screen. Um, and this is a dream of John Roots, who's in the back there, yeah. uh, who's talked about the, the VR and AR theater uh, for a long time, but we have some interesting explorations in the r &I space with it. Yeah, um, you know, we think that there's applications all the way from, from home entertainment to retail, future to, uh, you know, to Going back to the whole Uber tool set, you know, just just that sort of multi-platform social experience. I think if you uh, if you anybody's watched Amazon uh, or slung uh, you know Amazon onto their TV uh, while it's playing on your TV, the they're interactively adding showing you what actors on screen at that time, and you can sort of dig deeper into their bio, what they're doing, or uh, you can find out more information, and that's exactly what this could be. You start to understand the applications of how, where this is relevant. You want to you want to know more information. It, it winds up being here's the show. 
I want to find out more. You're not having to leave the space. You're just interacting and as the show's going on, um, constantly pulling in information. Uh, you can see that in obviously the real retail space where uh, you're, you're watching web pages and as the things you're looking on those, on those types of things are popping up, you're, you're showing you relevant content for the things that you're seeing on the screen. Great. And I'm just going to skip a couple in the interest of time here because um, I do, we'll touch on um, FACET in the next talk, uh, which is focused fully on virtual humans, but uh, Quentin, the creator of FACET, will be on the next panel, so I won't try to do it justice in the meantime. Um, but we, um, we have been exploring um, a couple interesting ways to visualize. So bringing the real, real world into a game engine uh, is a challenge. And um, you know, photogrammetry and LiDAR are two very uh, popular and, and uh, photo real data capture techniques. Uh, but then the problem is baking down that content into a way that's performant inside of the engine. Um, and so we did a project called the Wavana uh, where Lynette, the director, had brought a LiDAR scanner down to the rainforest. And this thing creates very dense point clouds, uh, which, which visualize the environment in a really interesting way. Um, and you can use that to register the actual distance and geometry of any kind of surface for recreating that environment. Um, but we built a tool for this project in particular uh, because it's meant to be a very subjective experience of a shaman going through a psychedelic journey. Uh, where we actually visualize the point clouds in real time in the game engine. And so we built a custom tool to do that in collaboration with a couple uh, freelance developers who had been tinkering in this area. And I just wanted to give you guys a brief glimpse um, of what that looks like, which is, and, and so there were a lot of um, performance optimizations that went into this, but this is, uh, it's a little dark, but it's 60 million points running in real time. Um, and the beautiful thing about maintaining a point cloud rather than baking it down to a mesh is that you can actually make each point individually interactive. And so you'll see some slight undulation to the floor, and that's because we attached a gaze-based controller. Um, so wherever you are looking in the experience, all of the, <laughs> I think there's some audio to it. Um, let me turn that down. But wherever you're looking in the experience, um, the environment is interactive around you. So you're actually bending and warping uh, the environment around you. Um, so you can see the, the slight undulation. And, and in this instance, it was meant to recreate a psychedelic trip. But there's immense freedom with what you can do to completely interactive environments um, that are representative of the real world. Yeah, and as far as the technique goes, there's, there's the fidelity that you get with LiDAR um, that's not quite the same as, say, photogrammetry. Um, there's a lot of purist uh, thought out there as far as like, capturing the data and maintaining its uh, most pure form. There's several tools out there that you can represent the data uh, as points, but they fill in. So when you're looking at the shapes, it looks like the lighting that you were there. And if you get really close, then um, you start to see the holes between. Mm -hmm. But at a certain resolution, everything looks like a photograph and behaves in the same way, except uh, it is rendered as points. So you're not, you're not throwing any data away. You're not augmenting the data. Turning it into a photogrammetry, that's an interpretation of those photographs. Uh, and even if you incorporate LiDAR data and you build photogrammetry based on LiDAR data, it's the same thing. You might have the right scale, but the shape of that tree or the shape of that ground was not exactly the way it was captured. It's been processed and uh, decimated into a low poly game asset, which makes it performant, but not quite the pure thing that you captured. So this, being able to represent uh, a world as points um, has a lot of value. Right, and then a final area to touch on um, is, you know, we, we build these really amazing interactive experiences inside the game engine, or we try to build amazing ones. And uh, the, the tough part is transportability. Um, obviously, the, the sixed off headsets don't have quite the, the market penetration that a lot of the community was hoping by this point, but you still want a lot of eyeballs on your experience. And so we found there was a real need to translate six degree of freedom experiences into um, 360 videos, which is a tough thing to do. And so um, Hiro Miyoshi, who's one of our um, research and innovation experts in the area, has been working on a, a plug-in for the Unreal Engine for the last year, year and a half, that 
exports 360 video and allows you know, a much wider audience to access uh, at least some version of the experiences we've been building. Um, so I wanted to give you a brief glimpse. Uh, it will only play in VLC. So let me pull it up there of what that looks like. Because, you know, something that's interactive like the point cloud visualization I just showed you um, will only work inside the engine. And so um, to export from the engine is a very powerful thing because then you can put it on YouTube and Facebook. Um, you can get people to consume it a million different ways. And so this was a, an immersive logo, top bottom stereo, um, that was exported using his tool that we built for the Technicolor Experience Center. So it's all particle effects inside the Unreal Engine um, baked out to a video. And yeah. I know you guys have used that quite a bit. Uh, we found it immensely useful. This actually came up from, uh, from a project that we were working on, uh, Mars, or Martian, um, uh, where it was a partnership with VRC. Uh, we were meant to capture our 360 video um, and, uh, and build a tool set and had, had the R&I guys come out and really developed it and made it production friendly. So that was a great relationship. And from that, um, the common use was we have these large, uh, heavy game engine assets, or uh, game engine projects that only we're going to get uh, a limited amount of eyeballs. So from, a, from an agency or a client point of view, they weren't really willing to spend the full featured budget, you know, the, like their, their entire budget on a particular thing that wasn't going to get the exposure that, say, TV or YouTube was going to get. Uh, this winds up being an excellent option where we, we're doing in the same way versioning. You know, we got your HD version, you got your SD version for the uh, older TVs. Here we're going and doing the sixth off uh, full game engine ex uh, experience, and then you bring that and you just uh, you're rendering uh, this out to a 360 video, which then you can do to Facebook, to YouTube, and it winds up being just another uh, version that gets more eyeballs. More people will see that, and uh, will see that in and draw hopefully you know draw that people those people back into the main experience, um, and then. An, on top of that, there's, you wind up having more people, in some cases, see the how-to video, in our experience, of what that is. Uh, so that video, shown on a flat screen or in a regular YouTube, will bring those people all the way back in uh, to your Sixtoff experience. So we've had several projects that have used Unreal and, uh, and needed this tool to, uh, as part of a complement suite. Awesome. So that was a very brief overview of you know, the many areas we're exploring, um, kind of a, a tool set for creators that we use internally every day, all the way from capture of the data to consumption. Thanks, guys. And stick around. We'll be, we'll be deep diving on virtual humans next.